Many young people and adults are suffering from a crisis of connection. Being disconnected from others and ourselves has resulted in soaring rates of depression, anxiety, loneliness, suicide, and even mass violence. So what's the solution? Well, stay tuned. Ahead, I'll talk with Dr. Niobe Way about Rebels with a Cause, reimagining boys, ourselves, and our cultures. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. For nearly 40 years, Dr. Niobe Way, an NYU developmental psychologist, has been conducting groundbreaking research with teenagers, particularly boys and young men from diverse backgrounds. Her work focuses on social and emotional development and how cultural ideologies shape child development. She's a recognized expert regarding friendships, loneliness, teenagers, gender stereotypes, masculinity, and the roots of violence. Dr. Wei, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you so much, Dan. There is over 40 years, I understand, of research here. So tell us about what inspired this book. Uh, what I've learned, from, particularly from boys and men over the last 40 years. Um, and it came from being a counselor in the late 1980s um, at a high school in Boston and listening to boys in particular talk about their friendships and how much they wanted friendships, how much they wanted particularly uh, emotionally intimate friendships, what I call deep secret friendships in my previous book, Before Rebels with the Cause. Um, and they talked about their desire for friendships and then their struggles to find other guys they could really trust and be vulnerable with. And then as they got older, so these are studies that I do. I follow the same kids over time on developmental psychologists. So I'll start when they're 12 or 13 and then follow them until they're 18 or 19. And then as they started to get older, um, they started to talk about how it was increasingly difficult to find these friendships or the previous friendships they had, they no longer felt close to them. Um, and so we began to hear a very different story where they were starting to struggle to hold, hold on to their friendships and also talking about how that was affecting their mental health. So linking very, very clearly in that early work that I was doing, um, having friendships with mental health. And that was very, very true for the boys I was hearing in the late 80s, Dan. Um, and then I became fascinated by why we weren't telling that story about friendships, but also about boys. Um, and so I started to, when I came to as a professor of NYU in 1995, I started to do uh, research studies funded by the National Science Foundation and the William T. Grant Foundation and lots of other foundations um, to investigate the development of friendships among teenagers, um, all teenagers, not just boys and young men, but I was really curious on what was happening with friendships as kids went through adolescence. And by the time it was about 2005, when I got the book contract to write my previous book, I realized my finding was sort of in my boys, the, what the boys were telling me particularly, which is essentially they sounded just like girls in their desire for friendships, their desire for the connection, their desire to share what they really felt and not be laughed at. Um, and so I wrote a book about it in 2011, um, talking about boys' friendships and talking about how as they get older and the pressures to man up, that's what I found was the main reason why they began to struggle. As they began to man up and the norms of masculinity came in that equated friendships, emotionally intimate friendships, with being so-called girly or gay. Um, and of course, in our culture that's homophobic and, uh, and, and can be misogynist as well, it's kind of a, it's an insult. Um, and so the idea is as boys became... Uh, older, they, they began to actually disconnect from their friendships and their desire for friendships because it sounded girly and gay. And then they started to suffer. And so you see the suffering in all sorts of ways. Boys' suicide rates go up uh, right about the age in which they start to disconnect from their friendships. Mass violence almost always happens between uh, ages about 16, 17, and 18, and 25. M most of those mass shooters are in that age group. So right as they begin to disconnect from what the friendships that they so wanted for their mental health and they so needed for their mental health, you start to see these signs of struggle and sometimes signs of violence. The new book, to bring it right to the front, uh, Dan, the new book is really realizing, I, I, when that book came out, Dan, it was sort of incredible in 2011 because I got an overwhelming response. I got a global response. I got people from around the world writing me emails. I was on the Today Show not many of times. I was all over the press. Um, and people were telling me, you're telling my story, you're telling my brother's story, you're telling my story, 
And oftentimes that went across identities. So I realized after the book came out that actually the story that boys and young men tell us, and in this case, it's particularly boys and young men of color from working class communities. And I'll talk about why I think that's relevant. They teach us actually not just about them. And Dan, this is the real kicker for the new book. They teach us about all of us in terms of who we are as human, what we need, how much we need friendships, deep, meaningful friendships in our lives, and then how culture, and in this new book, I call it boy culture. I'm hoping you'll ask me what that means. Uh, boy culture gets in the way of our friendships and our capacity to have these meaningful relationships. It then causes a, what I call a crisis of connection, where we disconnect from ourselves and each other. Um, and we see that through rising rates of depression, anxiety, loneliness, suicide, and, and mass violence. Um, and so that's the consequences of a crisis of connection. And then the solution, quite frankly, we can get to the solution, but the boys teach us the solution too, because what they do is they reveal that we have the natural capacity to have the relationships we want and need, not only to thrive, but to survive. And so because they remind us our natural relational intelligence, our natural capacity to read each other's emotions, to understand, to be sensitive to each other's feelings, et cetera, which are critical for relationships. Um, the fifth part of the story, I call it the fifth part of the story, they tell us a five part story, um, is actually around the solutions to this crisis of connection, not only for boys and men, but for all of us. Well, there's so much in this book. We can just sort of scratch the surface here and people need to get the book to learn more. But let's go back to talk about some of those things in a little bit more detail. And first of all was why this particular group of boys and why it was particularly relevant to what's going on today. Yeah. Okay, great. So what was interesting to me about, so my the, the, the sample in my studies are mostly boys of color from working class communities, not because I was seeking those, that demographic. It really came from that I work in public schools and public schools in this country are almost always low income people and many low income people are people of color. So it ended up that my sample was a particular demographic within this country. Now, why it's interesting to me um, that they are the ones that tell us the story, not only about them, but about us, is it's often been said in the social sciences, Dan, for, for, the, for your listeners who are less familiar with the social sciences, um, that people on the edges of power oftentimes can see things better. Their vision is clearer because they're sort of s suffering more severely the consequences of not having power. So you oftentimes have these examples of people, what I call on the fringes of power based on their race or their social class um, or their identities in some ways that actually have more insight into what's happening you know, in the center uh, of, of power in the country um, than those in the middle where you can't see it. You know, when, it, when it's you, it's hard to see yourself. Um, and so what was interesting is they told us a story about how they were suffering, but then it became obvious that they were telling us a story about all of us. And to me, it was coming from boys, if I want to just focus on why boys, it was really that boys are the people, the very people we stereotype as not wanting those relationships, as not being as skilled socially and relationally as girls and women, as not being emotionally literate or interested in emotionally intimate same-sex friendships. And so to me, why boys is important, boys and young men, is because they are directly countering that stereotype. And, and I, I want to add something to that, Dan, because it's very, very important to the book. Part of the way we get away with stereotyping boys in ways that have nothing to do with boys, Dan, and I want to really emphasize that. The way we stereotype boys almost has nothing to do with boys. Um, you know, I mean, yes, do they like to play, many of them like to play sports and like to misbehave sometimes and can be a little bit more too aggressive at times, sure. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but the point is, is that boys have this emotional, incredible emotional relational intelligence um, and just as much as everybody else. So once they, the reason we get away with stereotyping boys and young men in ways that have nothing to do with who they really are, it's because we start to confuse what is cultural to what is biological. So we've made this argument and you see it in current books on boys where we sort of make this ass assumption that somehow these gender differences that we that are just stereotypes, Dan, they're not real gender differences, they're just stereotypes, um, are actually biological differences. And as a seventh grader once told me many years ago, if you make it biology, you think you can't change it. 
Um, but the point is, is that it's not biology, it's cultural, and we can change it. I'm talking with Dr. Niobe Way about Rebels with a Cause, reimagining boys, ourselves, and our cultures. And our conversation continues in a moment. If you appreciate this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. And thank you. You point out in the book also that these gender stereotypes where we thought um, a few decades ago were getting better and that we were, you know, becoming more inclusive, but it's actually gotten worse. And that's resulted in this boy culture, which infuses itself into our culture at large, which creates all sorts of problems. Absolutely. And and that's the irony. And I, in fact, I have a piece hopefully coming out in one of the magazines about that, that sort of contradiction that we're now willing to be gender, you know, we're allowed, especially when I say the we, I mean, liberal communities, lefty communities, we're now willing to sort of accept gender fluidity and accept different kinds of pronouns and accept different kinds of identities, you know, at least more than we were, we used to uh, do that. But at the same time, we're actually going backwards, it appears in the data, in terms of our, our gender stereotypes around the he or the she. And this is the irony. So a lot of my students and a lot of my kids' communities are identifying now with they, which as their pronoun, which I think is a very powerful way to just, you know, to say, I don't accept the gender binary. But really what they're saying is I don't accept the gender stereotypes of a he and a she. And so they identify with they. And I think that's a great thing that they're doing that. However, the unintended consequences of having this third pronoun as an option is that it's made the he and she even more reified into a stereotype. So if you're, you're, you know, if you're a they, you disrupt the stereotypes. But if you're a he or a she, it's almost like we've gone back to my mother's generation of what a she means and what a he means. And I know that because I asked my students what masculinity and femininity mean. I put that in the book, Dan. I, I'm sure you saw it. Where, and they give definitions. Dan, you just would, it would blow your mind to listen to this. This sounds what I imagined from my mother's generation in the 50s, you know, the 40s and the 50s. Femininity is just caring about what you look like. It's, you know, it's some of good things too, in terms of, you know, caring about other people. So that's all good, obviously. Uh, and, and, but, you know, basically being superficial was femininity. And, uh, and uh, masculinity was independence, determination, responsible, smart. I mean, it was sort of unbelievable. Um, and I thought, we are going backwards. And part of it is, and I, I'm going to say something very controversial. It's, it's controversial, but I really see this in my data. The problem is, is that we've been too much focused on the pronouns rather than the meaning of those pronouns. So, you know, we, we, it becomes now choosing our pronouns which is a good first step. It's a good first step to raise questions about what does that he and she mean and do you identify with it? That's a good first step. But if you don't go to the thick story, Dan, that's, remember I talk a lot about in the book about the thick story, which is it's not the pronoun, it's the meaning of a he and a she uh, that's problematic because it doesn't reflect real people. And when I say boy culture, I, I want to throw into your listeners Boy culture is a cartoon character. It's not a real boy. It's boys who tell us about boy culture. And it's the privileging of the heart over the soft, thinking over feeling, self over other, you know, autonomy over connectedness. I could go on and on. The hard sciences over the soft sciences. I mean, anything that has to do with numbers, we privilege, and everything that has to do with words, we don't, we privilege much less and actually don't take us seriously. So we live in this hard, soft, binary, I'm going to, avoid academic talk. We live in this society culture that privileges the hard over the soft. And that means that we privilege only one half of our humanity over the other. We all have a hard and soft. And I'm going to say this to your listeners because it's very, very important to hear. Thinking and feeling is not gendered. It's not feminine to feel. It's not masculine to think. It's human. It's human. And that's what kids, boys and young men, reveal again and again and again and again that feeling is human, thinking is human, wanting independence is human, wanting to be stoic is human. It's not masculine. It's not feminine. <laughs> it's human. And the minute we gender it and we sexualize it, we get into trouble, right? Because then what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman means a man means to be not feeling and a woman means not thinking, <laughs> right? Then we're, we're in trouble. So it's the idea of really seeing these gorgeous human qualities we're born with, 
um, and then really creating a society. And I, I assume we'll get into sort of thinking about solutions. Uh, but let me stop for a second and give you a chance to ask questions. Well, I was just thinking, because I want to get to the solutions part, but a little bit more about the problems and how this culture has permeated, you know, everything to the point that we have what you describe as a crisis of connection. Yes. So we're disconnected from others. We're disconnected from ourselves. Yes. So we have all those bad effects that you talked about, depression, anxiety, suicide, yes. etc. Yes. So, yes, it begs the question, what is the solution? How do we turn that yes. around? How do we change it so that we can not have that disconnection and mitigate those problems? Yeah. So let me talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit like a psychologist for a second. I'm not a practitioner, I'm a researcher, but it's going to sound like a psychologist. I want to, in order to answer your question, I want, I want the listeners to hear why living in boy culture leads to depression and anxiety and loneliness, why it disconnects us from ourselves and each other. Uh, this is how it does it. If you live in a culture that values only one half of you, and in Chinese philosophy, that's called the yin and the yang. So the yang is the masculinity and the yin is the femininity. If you have a culture that just values half of you, <laughs> um, it's going to lead to you completely disconnecting from yourself because you actually naturally have two halves to you, the hard and the soft. You know, we use it. We see that a lot in different types of philosophies. And they the two parts of you are brought together to make a whole person. The hard and the soft make you a whole person. Um, and so if you disconnect from half of your humanity, it will lead you to disconnect from yourself. And if you disconnect from yourself, what you know about yourself, your own capacity to be, have the skills to create connections, your own soft skills, um, it will then disconnect you from others because there's no way of connecting. So the other, the other uh, so to answer your question now, Dan, the solution then is fundamentally, first of all, to see the problem, to see the waters in which we swim. Stop blaming people. Stop blaming if the problem is men or the problem is women or the problem is Trump supporters or the problem is Biden supporters. I don't care who you're blaming at the moment, but right now you have to see we are, we are all of us. I don't care what party you vote for. <laughs> we are all swimming in the same water, which is this what I'm calling boy culture, that's dismissing half of our humanity and the half that is necessary to form connections. So we need to, first of all, recognize the water in which we swim, then recognize that it's cultural, not biological, which means that's good news. That's good news, which means that we're actually naturally, we're, we're born with those hard, soft skills. Um, and so we can change it because it's just cultural. And then how we begin to change it is we be begin to reimagine how we're engaging with each other. So I talk a lot in the book about listening with curiosity. And we have this whole project called the Listening Project we've been doing in schools for over a decade at this point. Um, and we've been evaluating it with our research and we're finding incredible effects that when you teach, when you remind kids, because remember they have it naturally, when you remind kids and have them use their natural listening with curiosity skills, there's nine practices that I talk about in the book. These nine practices of listening with curiosity to not look at another person and judge them uh, with a question or assess, do you agree with me or not? But actually, what can I learn from you about you, but also about myself through you? And when we do that, when we listen with curiosity, Dan, when I ask you a question and you teach me something about you, but it also always teaches me something about me, right? In contrast or right, in the ways we're similar and different. I then begin to see myself in you, Dan. And to me, then when it goes both ways, that's connection. That's the connection that young people are starving for, Dan. The, the real connection. And so to me, we have to start to unlearn things to be able to practice learn, uh, listening with curiosity. Number one, we have to unlearn the, the assumption that if I share meaningful things with you and you share meaningful things with me, we're going to be connected. We won't. <laughs> because almost always we're not listening to each other. It's almost like a parallel play situation. <laughs> I'm talking and then Dan, you're talking. And neither of us are really listening. We're just trying to get into our, our word in, you know, into the conversation. So that doesn't create connection. What connects creates connection is when I look at you like the five-year-old with a sense of wonder and say, here's this gorgeous person in front of me. What can I learn from this person about the questions that 
that, that I have about the world or that I have about them or that I have about other people? What can I learn from you? The five-year-old in us, the five-year-old that looks at the world and other people with wonder. And that is our tool of resistance. I call it our tool of resistance, our natural tool of resistance. To, and it breaks down stereotypes. It, you can't look at someone with the stereotypes if you start asking them questions because they'll never sound like a stereotype. That's what I learned from listening to boys and young men, right? They never sound like a stereotype once you start asking questions about how they, you know, how they make sense of something, how they feel about something, et cetera. So the idea is we have to reimagine how we're engaging. And the reason why that's not a big lift, if everybody says, ah, changing the culture, that's a big lift. It's not a big lift because first of all, it's a natural skill and children are doing it all the time. So it's a matter of nourishing it when they're young and remi remembering it when we're old. But secondly, we're now so miserable at this point. <laughs> our rates of depression, anxiety, loneliness, right? Our rates of suicide, our rates of all forms of violence are so extremely high now, um, you know, that at, at some level we are desperate for a solution. And right, we're desperate for a solution. So. When I go into any room now and I start talking about this, listen with curiosity, I get young people surrounding me afterwards saying, oh my God, you're totally right. It's about being curious about others. Oh my God, I don't think any of my friends are curious. I don't know anybody who's curious. That's, you're totally right. Um, it's because we know it intuitively. Young people know intuitively. We just haven't taught it. And I have to throw in one thing because I am an academic. I have to throw in one thing, Dan. What's incredible to me is we're so bad off in our culture, boy culture, that in developmental psychology, Dan, I think I say that in the book, we don't even study interpersonal curiosity. We don't even have it as a topic. You know, we have emotional regulation, not emotional sensitivity, right, in the way we try to foster emotional regulation, but we never talk about emotional sensitivity. We talk about intellectual curiosity, curiosity about the world, but we never talk about interpersonal curiosity. We really do dismiss what we call the soft sides of ourselves um, that are essential for human connection. There's so much in this book we won't have time to talk about. And one of the key takeaways to me as I hear you discuss this is that we have to start at an individual level to have that curiosity, to listen to people. And enough, if enough of us do that, then we yeah. can change the culture. Yeah, absolutely. I'm convinced of it. And the reason I'm convinced of it is I work with hundreds of young people because I'm a professor at NYU um, every year. And I see the transition, I teach them the skill in every class, I it doesn't matter what I'm teaching. I teach them the skill as a way to teach whatever I'm teaching. I teach diff different topics. Um, and I see the transition and I see them come away from that class and they will always say, this changed my life, this changed everything about my life, I'm taking this out in the world, I've been doing it now for, all I've been teaching it for almost a decade and I still get students coming back to me and saying, that course changed my life. It taught me actually a new way to engage with each other that then changed everything in my life. I changed my major, I changed, right? I, I mean, all the things that matter in our lives, it just, it's easy. It's easy, and this is the thing, Dan, it's easy because it's just part of how we were born. It's natural to us. We don't have to teach curiosity. We just have to nurture it. We have to respect it. We have to value it. We have to, the next time you see a friend, Dan, I'm gonna give you an assignment. <laughs> I want you to ask a genuine question, you know, ask a question. It doesn't have to be a, I'm not talking about trauma questions. Oftentimes it's, what do you value the most? What are one of the, your top values that are really important to you? And then get into a deep conversation about why they value it. Where did that value come from? How did their mother express that value if it came from their mother? I mean, if it came from their church, I don't care where it comes from, but then talk, have them really talk about why they connect to that particular value and what it means to them. And then hopefully they'll do the same to you. And I promise you that conversation will lead to more deep and meaningful connection. And then you start you doing it all sorts of individual practices. Um, and we start to make you know, what I call my own, you know, social revolution of social revolution in really valuing the soft sides of ourselves, not valuing it more than the hard sides, because that would be, that would be the same problem. Flipping the hierarchy is the same problem. Valuing our social skills as much as our hard skills, numbers as much as words, feeling as much as thinking. I mean, and seeing how they intersect. They don't, they're not separate things. They work together. Right. Uh, so the idea is to we begin to value them and then we begin to interact differently 
And I promise you, we can completely change our culture to better nourish who we are as humans, but also what we need most to survive. Well, to learn more, the book is Rebels with a Cause, Reimagining Boys, Ourselves, and Our Cultures by Dr. Niobe Way. Dr. Way, thank you for talking with me today. Thank you so much, Dan. It was a pleasure. If you'd like to purchase Rebels with a Cause, I placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered. <laughs>